uh-uh, not today. Lord, we're grateful for your mercy. We thank you, Lord, that in these moments that we have together, not only are you merciful enough to have saved us and set us free, but you're merciful enough to not leave us to our own devices, that you have given us your word, Lord, so that we can hear you when you speak. So God, I'm praying in these next few moments that we have together, you would open up the pages of scripture and breathe a fresh word upon your people. Lord, we are so glad to be in the house with each other today, but Jesus, we didn't come to see each other, we came to see you. So I'm asking, Lord, that you would open up the windows of heaven and speak to us, Lord. We need a word from you, oh God. Our hearts are hungry to hear a fresh word from your voice. So Lord, you take this one little simple message, would you divide it 1,800 different ways so that every single person does not hear from me, but they hear from you. It is in the matchless name of Jesus Christ that your daughters agree and say amen tonight. Everybody say amen, amen, amen. You may take your seats. I want to tell you what a privilege it is to have the opportunity to be here tonight and to share a few thoughts with you um, uh, from the Word of God. It's particularly a privilege to be in this house because I have long been an admirer and a, and a texting friend of <laughs> Pastor Hillier. We will just text each other encouragement every now and then. And so that you would invite me to be a part of what God is doing in this ministry is a blessing. Now, I need you to know that when the invitation came for me to be a part of this, I did not know who the invitation was from at, the, at, at first. I just heard that someone wants you to speak at something that starts at 10 and ends at 5. I said, say what now? <laughs> and then they said, well, it, it's Pastor Bridget. And I said, well, let's go then. Let's go. Let's go. There is integrity and humility and faithfulness that is lost today. And we have that in Bridget Hillier. Would you celebrate her with me? It's sad. It's sad that humility is rare. Yeah. Ooh, it's sad that humility is rare. Y'all, it's sad that integrity is rare. That the same person who's standing under the spotlight is the exact same person when nobody's looking. Y'all, that's rare. And when you find somebody who actually does honor their husband and who actually does prioritize their family, and who is not after the limelight more than they're after a well done from Jesus the Christ. That's a person that you seal yourself to and you sit at your, their feet and you listen to what it is that God is gonna say to you from them, not because they're better than you, but because God has proven through their lives what it means to, to walk in integrity and faithfulness and that it is possible to do it God's way. It's possible to do it God's way. So I honor her and I honor her husband. I honor this house. It's a privilege to be here. And you know what? For just a second, uh, I also want to honor Cece Winans for the same reasons. Um, amen. I want to honor her for that. Because a whole lot of people can sing. But not everybody is anointed. A lot of people want to be superstars but everybody's not willing to be in their, in their closet in prayer, seeking the face of God, whether or not they win a Grammy, <laughs> whether or not they sell a lot of records, they sing it because they just love Jesus. And that's what you see in, in CC1. I'm gonna tell you really quickly, because I always uh, say this of her whenever I'm with CC somewhere. Y'all, I was probably about 14 years old. I do not know how I ended up in a home after Cece and Bibi had done a concert somewhere. My parents took me to this concert. And afterwards, there was dinner at somebody's house, and I happened to be able to go. And of course, I was this starstruck little 14-year-old. And I remember watching her. I watched her. Because, you know, I'm 14, and I'm like, that's Cece Winans right there. <laughs> so I'm watching her, and they were trying so hard to make a diva out of her. They were trying so hard to, to serve her every little thing and give her every little thing, and they didn't want her to do anything for herself. Her children were with her. They kind of wanted to take care of the children so that she could be uh, treated in a certain way. And I remember watching her and gleaning from her and learning because she would not allow them to steal from her the privilege of being her children's mother. Yeah. She did not hand them off to somebody else so that she could go be the diva. 
She was like, uh-uh, these are my babies. I'm going to mother my children tonight. I was 14 years old when I saw that. And it informed the ministry that I did not even know that the Lord would have for me. The way I mother my children today, I have three boys. The way I mother them today is largely because of what I saw one night off stage of C.C. Wines. I'm so grateful for that. I'm so grateful for that. I want to share a few thoughts from the scriptures this evening. I'm going to ask you to bear with me because I don't know if you can tell or not, but just getting over a little bit of a cold over the past week and a half. So I have a little bit of that scratchy uh, voice. I've been praying and saying, Lord, help me not to go into one of them coughing fits. You know, the ones you can't recover from. Um, so, so you just pray with me in that regard that the Lord will help us to get through what I believe to be one of the most impactful passages at least in my life over the past couple years. It's gonna be one that is familiar to you, but I love that about the scriptures, that you can read something or hear something you have read or seen a million times before. But on this day, the Holy Spirit can take out a divine highlighter and cause that thing to leap up off the page and grip you in your soul. So I'm praying for that today. As I mentioned, I have three boys and the identifying characteristic of my sons is that they are big boys. They used to be little boys, but not anymore. My 13-year-old is at least three inches taller than me, my 13-year-old. He wears a size 14 men's shoe. My 11-year-old, well, he just turned 12 in the last couple weeks. He's in a size 12 men's shoe, and my 7-year-old stands up about this higher, so they are giant boys. One of the ways that works for them, though, is that they do enjoy sports, so it works for them in sports. They kind of play whatever is in season at the time. Football's coming up, so that's where we are. Most every weekend, we are on a football field somewhere with one of these boys. But when it is baseball season, my second son has taken a liking to baseball. He enjoys it very much. He enjoys playing it, and I got to brag, brag on him a little bit to tell you that he's actually pretty good at baseball. And I don't know if it's because of his size or what, but he really does have a really good swing when he gets a good hit because of all that strength he has because of his size. He really can already. I remember when he was nine years old, it was the first time he actually hit a ball over the fence line for a home run at nine and 10 years old. Great at first base. He makes lots of stops and outs as the team's first baseman. So we've been pretty proud of Jerry Jr. as he has played uh, baseball. I like baseball season, mostly because it starts in the springtime. I enjoy it very much because, you know, you go out there for the practice at 7 p.m. or so, and there you sit on the bleachers while your kid is out there underneath the lights of the baseball diamond enjoying the cool breeze of summer. So I enjoy baseball because it starts in the spring. The only problem with spring ball is that it is going to become summer ball. And see, I live in Dallas, so, so I got it like y'all got it here in Houston. During the summer, it does not warm up a little bit. The sun comes out in full vengeance, like it is mad at you, like you did something to the sun and the sun is trying to get you back. You know what I'm talking about? And it's still okay when you only have practices in the evening and then that early morning game, maybe on a Saturday at eight or 10 o'clock in the morning, it's still okay when that's the case. But the problem with baseball season is that at the end of the season, they have the nerve to have a tournament. This means that you're going to go out there on a Thursday at 8 a.m. Your kid is going to play on Thursday at 8 a.m. Then they're probably going to play again at 10 a.m. Then they're going to give you a lunch break, but you have to come back for the afternoon 2 p.m. and 4 p.m. game. Then depending upon how your team did, they're going to switch that team to another bracket. They will face a whole another list of teams on the next day. You will play at 8 a.m. Then you will play at 10 a.m. Then you'll take a little bit of lunch break, but you got to come back for the 2 p.m. game and the 4 p.m. game. And then if your team had the nerve to do well on Friday, you have to come back on Saturday for the 8 a.m. game and then the 10 a.m. game and then you have a little lunch break and then two and four o'clock and you're sitting out there trying to be happy that your kid is doing well. Can I get one witness in the house that knows what I'm talking about? You're trying to be okay with this whole situation but really you are wondering if it is ever okay to pray your kid loses so you can go home. <laughs> Anybody know what I'm talking about? So this is the case a couple of seasons ago. I remember it was a particularly hot summer in Dallas, and there we were sitting in the bleachers. We could not wait for the lunch break. We were three days into the tournament. 
We just wanted to go to lunch so we could go to a restaurant that had air condition. That's what we were after was the air condition. And some ice water with ice that was actually still in the glass after a while. We came back refreshed, ready for the rest of the day. Opened up the back of the SUV, got all the gear out, the ice chest, the umbrella that you get from the outdoor sporting goods store. We got all our stuff and we took it over to the baseball diamond for the next game. We were walking, I was walking right behind my son. He is a gregarious, outgoing personality, ready for the next challenge, excited. He had a little skip in his step, step and his chest was poked out and his chin was up. He was ready for this next challenge that was in front of him. But from the car over to the baseball diamond, I watched my son's countenance change just from the parking lot to the baseball diamond. He, he was excited at first, but the closer we got to the, to the dugout, I, I watched his entire countenance change. I watched his chin begin to hang down. I watched as his shoulders were a little bit hunched over. I watched as he started wringing his hands just a little bit. I did not understand what was going on, but it was very clear that there was something bothering him. So I was trying to look around to figure out why my boy's countenance was changing so severely. And as we walked over toward the dugout, we passed some other players from another team. They were all strewn across the grass underneath the shade of a big oak tree. They were getting rest themselves before the next game. We had to pass right by them to get to the dugout. So as we walked right by, I got a good look at all of these players. And as soon as I did, I knew what my boy's problem was. This was the team we were about to face. And these boys we had faced earlier in the season. And when we had played this team, this team had annihilated my son and his team. It had been a complete upset, a complete embarrassment when we had played these boys right here. And these boys were the ones we were about to play. Now this team, this little, little league team, y'all, was filled with serious baseball players. You know the kind with the real serious parents? Y'all know what I'm talking about? Ain't nobody got time for all that. These are the kind of parents that when they gave birth to their boy, they put a mitt on one hand and a baseball on the other. They've been waiting for this their whole lives, you know? Serious, we were about to play them. As we walked by, we heard two of the teammates talking to each other. I think they thought they were whispering, but they weren't doing a good job. One leaned over to the other and said, there goes that big kid from the Red Sox team. Was that the one that hit the ball and it went over the fence? Yeah, that was the one at first base. Remember, he's the one that caught all those outs that we had. So you mean that's Jerry Shire. When my son heard his name cross the lips of the opposing team members, that head that was hung down, all of a sudden it popped back up again. I watched him stick his chest back out and I watched my boy get his swag back. I saw his countenance completely become transformed because it really is amazing how your countenance changes when you overhear and understand what the enemy really thinks about you when he sees you coming. The reality is in a room this size with this many women from this many different backgrounds, this many different marriages and families that are represented, family dynamics, careers that are represented, the reality is that most likely there are challenges that are spread out in front of many of our lives and if we get a good look at them, if we look at them too long and too hard, the reality is we will want to hang our head in discouragement and shrink back in fear and insecurity. That is unless you really overhear and understand what your enemy thinks about you when he sees you coming. Because listen, the reality is even if you don't believe what the word of God says to be true about you, even if you don't believe it, even if I don't believe it, the enemy does. Y'all, he knows that we have already been forgiven. He knows that he is already underneath your feet. He knows that he can form a weapon against you, but that that weapon will never have the opportunity to prosper. He knows that you have been made competent by the Spirit of God. He knows that you have been equipped for every good purpose to which you have been called in Christ Jesus. And he knows that in the end, we win. He already knows. So what a shame it would be for the enemy to believe more about your potential than you do. What 
a shame it would be for him to be able to just tussle out a little challenge in your line of sight, in your marriage, or in your finances, or in your singleness, or on your job, or in your school, or at your university. Just throw it out in front of the daughters of God, and we are already so insecure that we won't even step up to the plate of being who God has called us to be. And so when you and I leave here at 5 o'clock in the morning, Help us, Jesus. Because listen, then she had the nerve to give us blankets. <laughs> the problems that you left last night will likely still be there tomorrow when you get home. There in front of you, and you will have a choice to make. Will I step up to the plate and believe that my God will hand me the bat? and give me the power that I need, the instruction that I need to hit this thing over the fence? Or will I allow just the, the presence of the enemy, the fingerprints of the enemy in this division, in this relationship, or this discord in my heart, or this unrest in my mind, will I allow it to be enough to cause me to shrink back in fear and insecurity and never experience all of the power that I really have as a daughter of the Most High King? And it is to this end that I believe the Apostle Paul writes what I believe to be one of the most powerful passages in all of Scripture. Cece's already set it up for us in talking about going to war, because you do know, y'all, that life is not a playground, it is a battlefield. And the enemy is hoping that we will just go to church and clap our hands and wave our hands and do the religious thing, but nobody will go home and go to war with weapons that work. So the Apostle Paul writes, a letter to a group of believers in a place called Ephesus. He writes the book of Ephesians. Now y'all know the Apostle Paul was a bad boy. He gave us most of the New Testament. He wrote letter after letter, penned instruction after instruction, but of all that he wrote, scholars say that the cream of the crop of all of his writing, like the cherry on top of the cake, is the book of Ephesians. Because in the book of Ephesians, he spends the first half of the book just rehearsing who you are as a daughter. He wants you to know that you are forgiven, that you have been lavished upon with the grace and the goodness of God. He wants you to know that even if everybody else has rejected you, that God Almighty, the Father of the universe, has chosen you and called you by name. He spends the, the majority of the book of Ephesians just telling you who you are. And then he gets to the end in Ephesians chapter 6. And he says, I've got one final word just to make sure that you are secured and ready for battle. He says in Ephesians chapter 6, beginning in verse 10, he says, finally. He says, finally, you ought to be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. He says, you put on the full armor of God so that you may be able to stand firm against the schemes. Somebody say schemes. The schemes of the devil. He says, for our struggle, it is not against flesh and blood. It is against rulers and it is against powers. It is against the world forces of this darkness. It is against the spiritual forces of wickedness in heavenly places. He says, so therefore, you ought to go ahead and just lay down all of the weapons of this world which aren't doing you any good and pick up some weapons that actually work. He says, take up the full armor of God so that you may be able to resist in the evil day. And having done everything to stand firm, he says in verse 14, you stand firm, therefore. The Apostle Paul sets out almost for the first time in the New Testament the principle of spiritual warfare. This is the first time it is said this overtly, this conspicuously. This is the first time a spotlight is shined on it. There are other places in the Old and New Testament where we can infer it, we can gather that there is spiritual warfare, we can derive it from the text, but this is the first time within the New Testament that a writer comes right out to make sure that nobody misses it, to make sure that we don't walk out of here at 5 a.m. with any questions on our mind. He says, I wanna make sure you know you have an enemy. And the enemy that you have is not the person that you are sitting next to. Your enemy is not your husband. Your enemy is not your boss. 
Your enemy is not your coworker. I'm talking about that one that if she says one more thing to you, you're gonna knock her out. That one. It's not your problem. Your enemy is not flesh and blood. Anything you can relate to with your five physical senses in the external world is not your problem. And the enemy wants you to think that just because he is invisible, he is also fictional. So what he does is he disguises himself cleverly behind something that you can see in hopes that you will forget he's back there. Because he knows once you do that, you will direct all the wrong weapons at the wrong culprit. Then he's got you in the palm of his hand. So he's begun to disguise himself so much so that we've forgotten that it is the enemy that is behind much of the strife and much of the division and much of the financial difficulty and much of the struggles that we are facing, that it is not the flesh and blood that we can see. It's the enemy behind the scenes pulling the strings and hoping you will forget he is there. There was a little small church around the corner uh, from where I live. I take the boys there for their harvest festival. We love it. It's, it's around the October time frame, sort of their answer to Halloween. Uh, we will go to the harvest festival. And me and my little one, Jude, I've got Jackson, Jerry Jr., and Jude. Jude is our surprise baby. <laughs> Y'all, we still don't actually know how Jude made it. You know how he got here. And I named him Jude on purpose, because that's as close as I could get to Revelation, because it's finished. That's it. <laughs> so I take them to this harvest festival, and I stand in line with Jude behind these cars. They have a trunk or treat at this church. Does anybody know what I mean when I say trunk or treat? Okay, a lot of churches don't do it anymore, but this church still does. They have volunteers from the congregation bring their cars into the parking lot. They lift up their trunks, and each one of those car owners will basically uh, make a fair game, some sort of carnival-like game in the trunk. Kids line up one trunk after the other playing these games, and normally whether they win or lose, they give the kid a whole bunch of candy and send them home with, with a bag full of candy. The parents, we are just, you know, so grateful for that. <laughs> the most impressive game last year was a truck, actually. They had put a little step ladder so that kids could climb up into the bed of the truck. They had attached to the side of the bed of this truck a tabletop, a board that was about the same size as the bed of the truck. They cut six holes in it, draped it with some fabric, and out from those holes every few seconds, a puppet would pop through. They would give the kid a plastic, a huge plastic mallet so that the kid could stand there and try to hit all of the puppets on the head. It was a homemade whack-a-mole game is what it was, right? This was the longest line. Everybody could not wait to play this game. I'm standing in line holding hands with little Jude. He could not wait. And behind us, there was probably a four-year-old or so, five maybe, that was waiting with his mother. We were laughing hysterically, y'all, at this little boy because he was going on and on about several things that he was annoyed with in this whole situation. <laughs> He was, first of all, quite annoyed because he did not understand, Mom, why I have to stand in this long line. Aren't I supposed to be having fun at the carnival, Mom? I have an idea, Mom. How about you stand in this line while I go over here and do these carnival games, and then I'll come back when it's our turn, because, Mom, I'm supposed to be having fun, and I'm not having fun. But that's not the only thing he was annoyed with. He was also annoyed because, Mom, I don't understand what the point of this game is. Do you see that those kids keep hitting those puppets on top of the head, but every time they hit the puppet on top of the head, the puppet just comes back? What's the point of hitting the puppet on top of the head if the puppet's just going to keep coming back every time I hit the puppet on top of the head? The kid was going on and on, and we were all in the line. We were all laughing hysterically at this little boy. And before any of us could say anything, we just saw a four-year-old flash by our peripheral vision as he ran forward, grabbed the drapery off of the table, and pulled it clean off. <laughs> Underneath, there were three adults, puppets on each hand. So that day we laughed, but we also learned a very valuable lesson, that there is always something you can't see controlling what you can. And if you spend, and I spend, 
all of my time and my money and my manipulation and my anger and my frustration popping at all of the trouble that keeps coming up and showing itself in my marriage and in my finances and at my school and on my job and in my career. I will at best exhaust myself, but I will not have hit, hit, hit the enemy where it hurts. The Apostle Paul says in Ephesians chapter 6, would you pull back the curtain once and for all and let the enemy know that we got our eyes on you, that we're not going to let you play us for the fool any longer that we know how to use weapons that hit you where it hurts. So the Apostle Paul says, today's the day to stop directing the wrong weapons at the wrong person. Would you please look at the person next to you and say, girl, you are not my problem. I thought you were, but it's not you. Apostle Paul lays out what I believe to be not six but seven pieces of armor. Traditionally it is taught as six because he does say in verse 13 in verse 14 that your your loins need to be girded with truth and he does say that you need a breastplate on called righteousness and then in verse 15 he does say that you need something for your feet they better be shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. And then he does say in verse 16 that you do need to erect faith over your life because it will act as a shield that will extinguish all the flaming missiles of the evil one. Then he says you need something for your head to protect your mind against the schemes of the devil. So he says you need a helmet on called salvation. But then he says not only that, you need a sword, a dagger really of the spirit. It is the word of God. But he does not stop at those six because in verse 18 he says pray. You cannot have victory. Are y'all listening to me tonight? You cannot have victory unless you are a woman of prayer. You cannot have victory unless you take seriously a conversation with your God. Prayer is the key that unlocks all of the blessings that your God already has planned for you, but cannot dispense to you until you are found on your knees before him. And if I were the enemy, I would want to devalue the potency of what I know to be the most valuable weapon you have against me. That is why he has made our churches a house of great preaching and a house of great programs and a house of great impressive uh, possibilities for the community. All of those things are great, but Jesus said, let my house be called a house of prayer. Y'all, prayer is what pulls the curtain back. It is what allows us to direct all the right weapons at the right culprit. Prayer is what activates all the other pieces of armor so that they are infused with the divine activity they need to cause you to be able to stand firm against all of his schemes. So he says to pray. You and I don't have time to march through every single one of these pieces of armor, but just a couple of them that I thought you and I could talk about tonight. Is that all right? Just a couple of them to help us to stand firm against his schemes. Somebody say schemes. Schemes. The Apostle Paul wants you to know how serious this business is of warfare with the enemy because he wants you to know that the devil is not haphazard in his attacks against you. He says that your enemy is scheming. Okay, y'all, listen. If somebody does me wrong, I'm a pretty easygoing personality. I mean, it'll hurt, but I can get over that. But if I find out somebody has been scheming to do me wrong, oh, that's a whole nother thing. That's a whole nother thing. <laughs> because when I find out you've been studying me, You've been watching so that you can see what my habits are and when I come and when I go. You've been studying so that you can see what my weaknesses are so that you can best take advantage of me and lead me astray. You've been trying to find out what the proclivities of my flesh are so that you can 
tantalize me in a way that will lead me in a path of rebellion against my God. And when I find out that not only have you been studying me so that you can take advantage of me, but you've been studying this man that I've been married to for 17 years so that you can figure out what his weaknesses are so that you can lead him astray. And you've been studying him looking into his history so that you can figure out how to cause there to be combustion between his history and my history so that there is no unity and oneness in our relationship. And then when I find out that not only have you been studying me and not only have you been scheming against my man, but then you've had your eyes on these three boys that the Lord has given me to raise up to be warrior men for Christ so that you can take advantage of their weaknesses and stand against them as they try to walk forward to the destiny to which their God has called them. When I find out you've had your eyes on me and my husband and these boys, well now you better believe that if you've been scheming against me, I'm sure enough going to be scheming against you. That I'm not just going to stand back and, and let you run roughshod over my family. I'm not just going to stand back and let you uh, play me for the fool and, and let you run roughshod over my peace of mind and my peace of heart and this marriage that I have and these boys that I have been given to raise. Just like you should not just allow the enemy to come in. Y'all, we're the ones that are supposed to stand in the doorway of our homes, in the doorway of our cities and say, not today, Satan, not on our watch, not on our watch. So the Apostle Paul says, you got to be dressed right for victory. You got to be dressed right. And he starts with two pieces of armor in one simple verse that I want to share with you for a moment. In verse 14, he says, stand firm, therefore, having girded your loins with what? Come on, y'all. Having girded your loins with? Truth. With truth. I want you to picture the Apostle Paul sitting in what would have been a jail, jail cell. It probably would have been more like house arrest. He was on house arrest in a Roman prison for about two years at the time. He penned what was a letter at the time to the first century believers in Ephesus. I want you to picture him sitting on the cold, hard floor of his prison cell, sweat pouring down his brow, ink quill in, in hand as he hung over the parchment paper to pen this letter. And he gets to this final portion of the letter. Really, what is the exclamation point, the ceiling mark to everything he's wanted to say throughout this letter? And he's trying to figure out the best words to be able to help the believers at that time and the believers in this time on this evening at this church in the middle of the night, how they can figure out how to best wear these pieces of, of armor, how to best make sure that these spiritual virtues aren't just something they applaud because it sounds good in the message, but they walk out of here with this pe these pieces on, infused as a part of their life. Picture him looking up from where he is trying to find the right words and looking up to the doorway of his cell where there would have been a Roman centennial standing guard. Roman soldiers were a ubiquitous presence during the first century, meaning they were everywhere. Civilians, everybody knew what a Roman soldier looked like. And they knew the features of the Roman soldiers' um, gear. They would have known, for example, that the most obvious thing they could see from afar off was a helmet that most of the time had brightly colored, colored feathers that were standing high above them. They would have noticed that. It would have been impressive. Not only that, but they would have seen the breastplate. The breastplate was the heaviest piece of armor that the Roman soldier would wear. So they would notice that first. They would notice, first of all, what would be most obvious to them was not only the helmet, not only the breastplate, but that impressive shield. Y'all, the shield was like a door. There were iron, uh, or sorry, wood planks that were sealed together. There was an iron hub right in the middle, and it was tall enough and wide enough that when crouched down, two or three soldiers could get behind the shield. When you first saw a soldier, you would see that shield. You would see that helmet. You would see the breastplate. Those were the things that were most impressive and applaudable when you saw a Roman soldier coming. But when the Apostle Paul looked to see what piece best correlates with truth, he did not pick the obvious. He did not pick the impressive. He did not pick the applaudable. He picked the piece of armor that the soldier put on first. 
Because underneath all that impressive stuff, there was a belt that held everything else together. Paul said, now that's truth right there. I cannot assume that because you came tonight, you are a woman who is girded in truth. Oh, I hope you go to a Bible teaching church like this one we are in tonight. I hope you are planted in the house of God somewhere, wherever you live, whether it's on this side of the planet or on the other side of the planet, wherever it is that you have come from. I pray that you are planted in a Bible teaching church, but I'm afraid that just because you go to church does not mean you are a woman who is guarded in truth. Oh, y'all, I'm hoping you're in Bible study. I'm hoping you don't just hear the, the, the word preached on a Sunday morning. I mean, that's great, but you need something midweek to just keep you going all the way through. I hope you're in Bible study, but I'm afraid to say that you can be in Bible study after Bible study and still not be a woman who is girded in truth. And the sad thing about this generation, I'm putting myself in this generation, 45 maybe and under, the sad thing about us, y'all, is that we are impressive and we are applaudable and we have Instagram likes and we've got a whole bunch of followers on Twitter, but we have no belt of truth. There is no allegiance to the truth of God. I'm talking about an allegiance that is not politically correct. Yeah. I'm talking about an alle allegiance that will make you at your university be the only one that the professor doesn't give the great grade to because you did not agree with his philosophy. I'm talking about the only one that on your job says, uh, -uh I'm not getting the promotion that way because my word says that I will follow my God in integrity and I will honor him all the days of my life. Only you can make a decision whether or not you're going to wrap yourself in the truth of God. Yeah. It does not mean you applaud it. Yeah. It means that you live according to it. Y'all, yeah. let me tell y'all why truth is so important. Are y'all with me? Everybody with me? Amen. Let me tell y'all why truth is so important. Because the enemy's number one MO. Are you listening in the balcony? Listen. The enemy's number one MO. I mean, his calling card, where you can see him coming from a mile away, is deception. Yes. Yes. Here's the tragedy with deception. Embedded within deception is a blinding agent so that the person who is being deceived doesn't know. What's so dangerous about deception is that it's not a plain old flat out lie, y'all. What's so dangerous about deception is that you, if you're being deceived, you're standing on the edge and you're about to take a step off and everybody else around you can see that if you take that step, it is not going to go well for you, but you can't see it. The danger of deception is that you think this is the best relationship for you, so you walk down that path. The danger of deception is that you were sure this was the, the business acquisition that you should make. This was the partnership that you should have. This was the road that you should walk down. And the truth is, if we were to take this little microphone that I have on and pass it around this room, there would be testimony after testimony of people who have been deceived. Oh, the enemy pulled the wool over your eyes. You've seen it so clearly before because y'all are just like me. You've had friends who were trying to explain to you why this relationship they are choosing is the best relationship for them. To them, it makes complete sense why they would leave their spouse and choose this relationship because this is going to be healthy for them. This is going to benefit them. And you're listening to their explanation. And the more they talk, the more your eyebrow lifts up in curiosity because you cannot see how they can see that they're being deceived. Oh, and that's the danger of deception is that when it's you, you don't know. It's only in hindsight that you look back and realize he played you for the fool. Oh, and if the truth be told, some of us in this room right now, y'all, we are reeling right now from the consequences of signing our name on a contract that the enemy did not let us see the fine print of. 
We didn't see all of those warnings. You know, like when you see those commercials, you can take this for your headache, but you may lose your eyesight and you may lose your left arm and you might have a stroke and you might not wake up tomorrow morning, but your headache will be gone. <laughs> so we walked down that path and we did that thing and we agreed to that. And now we realized he was taking us for a ride. The only way that you and I can have any defense against deception is if we are girded in truth. It is the first line of defense against the enemy because when you're being deceived, you don't know. Y'all, there's a movie that was out uh, several years ago called Inception. I didn't see Inception, uh, Pastor Bridget, I didn't go see it. The reason why is because when I go to the movies, I just want to relax. I don't want to use any brain capabilities at all at the movies. <laughs> I want to chill out, which is why I did not see Inception, because I heard it was serious business. Dad told me about Inception. He loved it. He said Leo Di DiCaprio's character was in reality but would often fall asleep. When he would fall asleep, he'd be in a dream world. And the problem was that in this dream world, everything was so real and so tangible that he thought he was in reality. So he would make decisions as if he were in reality, but they were getting him in trouble because he wasn't, he was in a dream. If that weren't confusing enough, sometimes when he was in the dream world, he would fall asleep and enter a second layer of dreaming. And in this dream world, everything was so real and so tangible that he thought he was in reality. So he was making decisions based on reality, but he wasn't there, so they were getting him into trouble. And if that wasn't confusing enough, Sometimes when this brother was already in the second layer of dreaming, he had the nerve to fall asleep and have another layer of dreams. So now he is three layers deep. He's not just in a dream. He's in a dream that is within a dream that was already within a dream within his reality. And it, it's too much, isn't it? It's too much. It's too, it's too, it's too much brain requirements for that movie. So about halfway through, he starts taking this spinning top with him. Wherever he is, he finds a flat surface and he spins this top and he watches it. If it spins endlessly, if it never slows down, if it never falls, well, he knows gravity is not at work, so this in the real world. If it does slow down, if it falls over eventually, he knows that there's gravity at work here, I must be home. He has stopped trusting in his own perception he stops trusting in what, what his feelings tell him are real. He has a standard that is outside of himself to look to, to help him to determine whether or not he's being taken for a ride. Oh, y'all, the enemy hopes that you will trust your feelings. He so hopes that you will lean to your own understanding. He so hopes that you will not make a choice to gird yourself in truth, that you'll have an objective standard that is outside of yourself because he can deceive you. You need something that is an objective standard, the same yesterday, today, and forevermore, never changing. And when you have this set as your standard, he can't play you like he can play everybody else because you've got a standard that is not subject to the way you feel. I wonder if there's anybody in the room that's ever been taken on a ride by your feelings. Ooh, he hopes you'll trust what you feel. But if you are a woman who is girded in truth, you have just uh, aligned yourself with the first line of defense that the enemy cannot take advantage of. Just one more for tonight. He not only says in that same verse, verse 14, that you need to have your, your loins girded with truth, but he also says you need a breastplate on. Yeah. He says you need something to guard your heart. He says you need a breastplate, and your breastplate is called? Righteousness. Come on, y'all, it's called? Righteousness. Righteousness. Jerry and I live in a fairly rural part of the Dallas-Fort Worth area. We like it that way, kind of out in the country, but we're close enough to the city. We can get there in 10 minutes, really easy. But we live on a little quiet two-lane um, road. Somebody's got horses over there, and somebody's got cows over there, and, and there's creeks and uh, bugs and mud and things boys need in their life. 
I'm one of those mamas who believes in outside. Amen. Go outside. That's what I say. <laughs> Anytime they have the nerve to come to me and say that they are bored, I say, no, you're not. You see that tree right there? Go play with it. <laughs> Go play with it. So that's why we live out there. I love it. I love that they have room to run. That's what I like. One of the other reasons why I like it is because a friend of mine lives across the street. That's how I kind of discovered that place. When my boys were little, I'd take them to go visit Rachel because she lives across the street. She has a pond. I love seeing my boys throw that stick out on the pond and her dog go out and chase that stick and bring the stick back. I loved who my boys were out there. So still to this day, my boys and I will go to the pond. We grabbed the two fishing poles that I bought on sale at the local Super Walmart around the corner. I also have a tackle box that I got on sale at the, at the Super Walmart because we do like going fishing, and, and I like fishing. I don't mind fishing with the boys, but, you know, I, I need some gear to go with me. So in that, in that little tackle box, we have extra hooks, we have extra bobbers, and we also have gloves because I don't mind going fishing, but I ain't finna touch no actual fish. <laughs> so we go fishing, and we stand in this little corner of the pond underneath the shade of some trees. Most of the time we stand right there on the shallow end where we're just going to catch sun perch, real small fish, nothing major. We'll walk, walk over there, cross the street, grab the extra hot dog meat from the week. That's our bait. We're real professional. We're real professional. And we fish. Sometimes I'm feeling adventurous, y'all. My neighbors have this little old metal rowboat they bought on Craigslist some years ago. They always leave it turned upside down on the edge of the pond. It's turned upside down because any water that collected the last time it was out, the water needs to drain. And of course, if they left it right side up, you know, it would fill up with water if it rained. So they, they need to leave it upside down. But if I'm going to get in it with the boys, I always have to think twice about that choice. Because the environment that has been created underneath that boat, boat is moist, it's shady, it's cool, it's the perfect environment for critters. So I have to brace myself if we get ready to turn this thing over. Because I know if we turn it over, something is inevitably going to hop out from underneath it. Something's going to waddle out from underneath it. Or worst of all, something's going <laughs> to... So anytime I'm feeling brave and adventurous, I stand way back, way back. I get the back end of the boat, the boys get the sides, and we flip it over. Inevitably, something comes out from the boat. It's always interesting to me that never once, never once, have I had to write a golden sealed invitation and send it into the brush nearby, inviting the critters to come and join us at 1 o'clock on Saturday. We'll be there. Never once have I had to send out a clarion call into the, to, to the trees nearby to let them know that they are invited to come and join us. I've never had to invite them because the environment created by the upside down boat is invitation enough. Righteousness is right side up living that invites the sunlight of God's favor and blessing on your life. Unrighteousness is upside down behavior that is out of alignment with the truth that you just said you would affirm for your life. And that upside down behavior means you don't have to invite the devil and demonic activity into your life. That upside down behavior is invitation enough. It creates an environment in which the demonic influence can be cultivated in your life to where they won't only feel welcome, but they will flourish. It means you can be in your war room play, praying against the devil till you are blue in the face. But if you come out of your war room and live a raggedy, wayward lifestyle that is outside of the alignment with the truth of God's word, you got to know that the enemy is on his way. In fact, if you are seeing the fingerprints of the enemy in any place in your life or in mine, I'm talking about a lack of peace, uh, jealousy, strife. I'm talking about the fingerprints of the enemy, sickness and disease on your life. Just ask yourself. It might not be the case, but just ask God. Just like David did. Search me, O oh God. Examine me. Let me know if my boat is upside down. 
Let me know if my attitudes and if my actions are out of alignment. Let me know, Lord, if in some way I'm creating an environment where the devil feels like he can make himself at home up in here. So that by the empowerment of the Holy Spirit, I can get on with the business of writing myself so that I can have your favor all over my life. Y'all, that's what I'm after. Anybody want God's favor on your life? Y'all, we don't have time to play games. We need God's favor. When Moses was on his way to the promised land, remember, God got so upset with him, he was like, y'all go ahead, I ain't going to the promised land. And Moses said, uh-uh, hold up. Exodus 33, 15, he said, if your presence is not going with us, I ain't going. Because he said, what will mark us if we do not have your presence? Y'all, that's what's going to mark us. It's God's presence on us. It's his favor on us. Y'all, it's not Instagram followers that's going to mark us. It's not impressive pictures that is going to mark us. It's not the applause and the celebrity, the appreciation of people that is going to mark us. It will be the anointing of God upon our life that will mark us and separate us from everybody else. Paul says, if you want a breastplate that will cover the most vital spiritual organ that you have. Listen, y'all, a soldier, are y'all still with me? A soldier could be strong. He could be well-versed in battle. He could have tons of experience because he's done this before. He knows all of the formations. I mean, he's a good soldier all the way around. If he was a great soldier, but he had no breastplate, one blow to the heart would wipe him out. Didn't matter how smart he was. Didn't matter how impressive his formation was. It didn't matter the t-shirt he had on or the bumper sticker that was on his car. Didn't matter how much religious activity he participated in. No breastplate, one blow to the heart will wipe you out. What the physical heart is to the physical body, the spiritual heart is to your spiritual life. All of the vitality that you need to be pumped into your spiritual life so you keep walking in fervor and in passion and you have a vibrant relationship with Jesus Christ so that your relationship with him, so that your uh, Christianity is not dumbed down to just a religion where you read a verse a day to keep the devil away, but where there's a conversation and vitality happening with your God where you serve him in spirit and you serve him in truth. That kind of vibrancy comes from a healthy spiritual heart. Which is why if I were your enemy, more than anything, I'd be after your heart. Because one blow to the heart and I can wipe you out. So when the enemy schemes against you, y'all listen to me, when he schemes against you, he's trying to figure out how to get that breastplate off. Do you think it is by chance that that particular temptation, that temptation, that's your thing. That same temptation to your friend would make no difference because that ain't their thing, but that temptation is your thing. It's the one that suits your fancy. It's the one that tickles your inclinations. It's the one that makes your eyes take a second look. Do you think it is by chance that that temptation happens to show up in your life when you are particularly hungry, (laughs) particularly tired, overwhelmingly lonely, and then the temptation shows up? Y'all, that's not a coincidence. That's a scheme of the enemy. Because the enemy wants your breastplate off because then he knows that the most vital spiritual organ that you have is at his disposal. One more thing and then I'm gonna be done. Your heart, y'all with me, everybody okay? Listen, your spiritual heart is the centerpiece of your soul. It's the hub of your soul, okay? Your soul is composed of your mind, what you think, your will, what you purpose to do, your ambition, or your uh, emotions, what you feel, and your conscience. Your conscience is not the voice of God, but your conscience is like the microphone that the Holy Spirit uses to help you hear the voice of God. Okay? If I were your enemy, ooh, I'd be after your heart. Because with one blow to the heart, I automatically have access to your mind. 
Now I can tinker with your thoughts to cause them to be so distorted you don't know what it is that God thinks and how to align your thinking with him anymore. If I were the enemy, I'd be after your heart because not only would I have access to your mind, now I have access to your emotions. I can mess with the way you feel. And not only that, if I could just get your heart, I'd not only have access to your mind and to your emotions, but also to your ambitions. I would make it so that you, what you want to do does not align with what God desires for you to do. Oh, but not only that, more than anything, I'm after your heart because then I'd have access not only to your mind, not only to your will, not only to your emotions, but then I could short circuit the wires in your conscience so that you can no longer hear and sense the conviction of the Holy Spirit. Oh, he doesn't want you hearing the voice of God. He wants the Bible to look nothing like vibrancy and fervency and a personal intimate word. He wants it to just look like black ink on a page. He doesn't want it to be valuable and intimate between you and God. And so he wants to short circuit these wires. And if you have no breastplate on, you have given him full access. Righteousness does not mean perfection. It means a lifestyle that you have made a choice. As for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. And unrighteousness doesn't mean that you are walking in continual obedience. It just means that you have made a choice. In a specific area of your, of your life, I'm talking about where you already know after this session you plan to go home because you've already made an appointment for 1.30 a.m. somewhere you have no business being. It's a planned disobedience. It is a lifestyle. You've already decided that you don't want this breastplate on. Righteousness is not perfection. It just means that you have chosen, I'm not going to plan obedience, disobedience. It's not going to be scheduled and put to my life. I am not going to knowingly walk down a path that I know is dishonoring to my God. When I sense the conviction of the Holy Spirit saying, whoa, I'm a hold up. When I sense him saying, stop, I'm going to stop. Not by my own strength and power, but because the Holy Spirit lives in me to empower me to be what I cannot be in my own strength and in my own power. The armor of the Roman soldier, y'all, it weighed about 70 pounds. Can you imagine trying to be nimble and quick and agile in battle with 70 extra pounds on you? The heaviest portion of that weight was in the breastplate. The breastplate could weigh so heavily on the shoulders of the soldier that it would wear him out before the battle even started. I mean, that thing was so heavy that before he even started, before he even took his first step in the real act of battle, he would have no energy left with which to advance against the enemy because he was already so weighed down because the breastplate was so heavy to carry on his own. Part of the job of the belt was to take some of the weight of the breastplate off of the soldier's shoulders so that the soldier didn't have to carry all that weight by himself. Righteousness, your own, is too heavy a weight for you to carry by yourself. If the enemy can't shackle you by sin and addiction, he's going to shackle you by perfectionism so that you're so weighed down trying to impress God with your own righteousness that you don't even have any energy left to live free and fully for your God because your own righteousness is weighing you down. Y'all, it's too heavy a load for you to carry all by yourself. But there's some truth. There is some truth that can take that weight off of your shoulders. There's some truth that can set you free. And here's the truth. The truth is, that 2,000 years ago, a man named Jesus Christ, he died on the cross of Calvary. And when you accept his gift of salvation in your life, 
Not only does he withdraw from your spiritual bank account the sin, the debt, the wages you owe for what you have done and what I have done, but he doesn't just withdraw, then he credits you with something. He credits your spiritual bank account with the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Yeah. This is some truth that will set you free because now you know righteousness is not on your shoulders anymore because now you know that the truth of God takes the weight off of you trying to have your own righteousness because his righteousness has been your gift. And I just wonder if there's anybody in the room tonight and you are so weighed down trying to impress God. That righteousness is wearing you out. You've got perfectionism on you like a shackle trying to be something that only the gift of Jesus Christ can be and give to you in your life. I want you to bow your heads and I'm going to ask you a question that right now in the middle of the night is the best question you could ever be asked. I want to ask you if you have ever received the gift of Christ's righteousness on Calvary. I want to ask you if you have that weight on you that is weighing you down so much so that honestly you can't live free and fully because you realize today you've been carrying your own righteousness and you are so sure enough tired. You need something to take the weight off. As your head is bowed and your eyes are closed, can I just ask you that if you need this gift tonight, if you've never just received Jesus Christ as your Savior, I don't want to assume tonight that you have just because you're here. Spiritual victory in, in warfare starts here. It starts with you having a relationship with Jesus Christ. And so as every head is bowed and eye is closed if, you, closed, if you are in this room, you've never made that choice to accept Jesus Christ as Savior and receive his righteousness. Would you just lift your hand and lift your eyes so that my eyes see yours and I'll know this is a decision that you need to make tonight. Is there anybody that does? In the balcony or on the floor, anybody? Just 10 more seconds or so, is there anyone? It's good news if there's not. <laughs> Anybody? Well then I ask, if there's anyone in the room and you are facing such serious spiritual warfare and you've been directing the wrong weapons at the wrong culprit, and today you realize that it's the enemy who is behind the scenes stirring up trouble. And you want to commit today to exchange the weapons of this world for weapons that actually work. You want to be a woman who makes a decision to gird yourself with truth and to put on a breastplate of righteousness. If you have a particular issue in your life and you need prayer in this regard, would you please just stand to your feet and let me pray for you as we close. Lord, I pray for my sisters who are standing up. They are saying by their boldness that there is an issue in their life where they see the fingerprints of the enemy upon it. So Lord, I ask right now in the name of Jesus that if there is any assignment that the enemy has against these women and against their families, I pray that that assignment would be canceled in Jesus' name and by his blood that has been shed on Calvary. Lord, I speak against the enemy and I say that he will leave these women alone, Lord, that he will not mess with their minds and not mess with their hearts. He will take his hands off of their marriages and off of their kids and off of their health and off of their finances in Jesus' name. And Lord, I pray that you would make us women of courage, that you would make us women of victory. I pray that when we leave this place in many hours from now, Lord, that we will be women girded in the weapons of warfare that are divinely empowered for the tearing down of strongholds, Lord. I pray that today we would be the day we pull back the curtain, let the enemy know that he cannot take us for a ride, not one more day, Lord, because we are women dressed for war. It is in Jesus' name that everybody agreed and said amen. 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 Hallelujah. Praise God. Can everybody just bow your heads just for a moment? And even though she made the appeal and no one raised their hand, I don't want to just take for granted we're all born again. So if everybody would just repeat this prayer.